Well, I see the UN role as very important and still probably more important than many people realize. And that's in part because I worked for 20 years for the UN uh, with UNICEF for children and with UNDP in the Human Development Report. And one thing I learned there was that 80% of the UN's work is not linked to the Security Council and the big clashes of East and West, but concerned with people and children, older people, uh, migra migrants, and so forth throughout the world. And there the UN has often had more influence than many people realize. I said it was already 80% of the UN's work and it's actually also been 80% or more of the UN successes. If you go back, as I did when I left the UN uh, and worked on a history of the UN, one can see that in many areas of action, the UN has had a major influence because it is the only international legitimate body. So, in human rights, in gender rights, in setting goals for the future, economic and social goals for the future, in leading the, uh, the uh, efforts against climate change, and in setting out a human frame for this, the UN has actually influenced ideas and the way we actually see the world more than many people realize. Indeed, our final volume of this UN history was called UN Ideas That Changed the World. And actually, one could see uh, that many of these issues I've mentioned, people's thinking has changed totally different in, two, in the 21st century than it was in the mid-20th 19 mid century when the UN was created. So that's one reason why I'm both positive about what the UN has done and positive about what the UN will need to do in the future. Uh, I believe the U people do talk in the UN but they don't agree. Okay. And one of the key elements in setting up the UN in 1945 was that the five leading powers at the end of the, first, of the Second World War should have a veto, which means they talk in the Security Council, the 20% of the UN's work. But if one of them doesn't agree, he says, veto, veto. And many people, ordinary people say, but why should the U.S. have the veto? Why should the Russians have the veto? Why should the British and the French, who after all are little powers now, have the veto? And the answer was that when they set up the League of Nations after the First World War, the U.S. never joined. The U.S. chair was empty. And so when it came to setting up the U.N. at the end of the Second World War, they said, how can we be sure the U.S. will join, the Soviet Union will join, uh, and the others, give them a veto. Now, that, that is a pessimistic conclusion, but it's reality. That's why people talk, often disagree, but can't decide, because one of them votes for veto. So what chance is there that that will change? And that's when I take you back to this UN history. We actually, uh, in our UN history, when we looked at all that the UN had done, we came to the conclusion there were three UNs, not one. First UN we all know about, governments, as I'd mentioned. There's a second UN, which is the staff members of the UN who work there. And often they have more power than civil servants in a government in making a difference. Because often when the governments don't agree, the civil servants, the Secretary General, but many others in other agencies, they can give leadership and often find ways through. And when it came to, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Wu Tant, as Secretary General, behind the scenes talked to the Americans, talked to the Russians, and did quite a lot to, to um, explain each party and bring each party to avoid nuclear conflagration. So that, that um, 
party, that possibility of the Secretary General using his personal influence is important, and lots of other examples. But I said there's three UNs, yeah. the governments, the second UN is staff members, like the Secretary General and down. The third UN is non-government groups, civil society groups, and so forth. And they often, in many areas of action for children, for human rights, for gender rights, they've often been very influential when you look at the history. So governments may be against something, as many of them were with gender rights, but when the UN had held global conferences in Mexico, in Copenhagen, in Nairobi, in Beijing, many of the women, but also the men who had been to those conferences, went back to their own countries and mobilized for, in that case, women and gender issues and so forth. So actually, again, the UN has had a great deal of influence, influence through this third UN, and that's often made the first UN more willing to take action, not at once. But when you ask me, what am I hopeful for the future, then I say yes, because the third UN is actually more powerful today than I think it ever has been in all countries of the world. First of all, no simple answers. Secondly, I don't think we're going to get the answers from bombing whether bombing by the West or by the Soviet Union or anyway, there are some problems in which war doesn't solve. Mm -hmm. Okay, then what is the solution? Not immediately, but at some point, I think one may have to bring the parties together in Syria, try and uh, bring the parties together with the uh, Islamic uh, Taliban in Afghanistan, the Sunni, the Shias in Iraq. That's the long-run answer. Actually, the UN, the second UN in Syria, for example, um, a good friend of mine, mine, um, of mine who worked for UNICEF has been there trying to bring the parties together, getting a ceasefire for three days, for a week, and it hasn't worked. But he goes on trying. Stefan Di Mastura. No, Stefan Di Mastura, yeah. yes. Wonderful man and showing all the qualities you need as a good UN staff member. Lot of experience, endless patience, endless willingness to try and understand the different sides, endless... They effort. argue all the time in that the Security Council, I watch it every day or every week, they argue about Syria, they don't agree, they... Uh, but Stefan Di Mistura, I'm talking about not the yeah, first okay, UN, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, second the second UN. And I'm not saying that the first UN is any simple answer, but at some point this year, five years' time, I hope 15 years' time, people will say it's been crazy, bombing, killing, trying to bring parties together. And there are examples in the world. My own, in my own country, Northern Ireland, is one where there was, what, 40 years of bombing and strife, but eventually the political parties came together and largely for the last, what, five, six years, we've not had, had that. Look at uh, the starting of, um, of the European Union uh, in Europe. There was 500 years of battles between the French, the Germans, the British. No simple answer. We had 500 years of war. But that's what I think we've got to look for. And because, again, it's a matter of values, see? And I'm a, I'm a UN person through and through. I don't believe in war. So do you say, well, has simple peace always succeeded? No. But in the long run, yes. I hope I've said enough to say I see that as an important part of the third UN. It, you know, with outside but close links, changing attitudes, not at once. I love the fact you have many academics. I'm an academic myself. I worked 20 years for the UN, but then I worked on research and other things. And you need all sorts of those people. And I think the European uh, Conference on Peace and Development brings those together.
as does the University of Peace, which I visited in Costa Rica. May I, may I end by saying one reason I love going to Costa Rica, they've had no army since 1948. And people, not everyone knows that a country has existed now for well over 50 years with no army. So I love to say to students and other people, how many other countries in the world have no army? Answer, over 20. Panama, lots of smaller, the smaller islands have no army. It's, it is possible to, to live without an army. And one of the things that I loved about uh, Costa Rica, if you don't have an army, what happens when the police go on strike? So who runs the traffic? Answer, in Costa Rica, you train the Boy Scouts and Girl Guides to, uh, you know... Uh, how regulate the yeah. army? It's possible to have no army. And if you don't have an army, you have a lot of extra money for spending on education and health and other things, which is why all these things are much better in Costa Rica than in the surrounding countries.